Good afternoon, everyone. So hopefully I can now use this idiot-proof machine. Excellent. There we go, idiot-proof. Right, so the first thing I learned as a cup consultant was when you deliver a PowerPoint presentation, it should be like a mini skirt, short enough to attract attention, long enough to cover the subject. Now, my colleague James Walker sends his apologies. He can't be here today, so if you're here for the engineering, you're out of luck. The good news is the talk is going to be somewhat shorter than I planned on. And the other thing that would be quite entertaining is because there's been a frantic rewriting of this presentation over the weekend, some of these slides are going to be just as much a surprise to me as they are going to be to you as well. So, today's learning. Oh, bloody hell. This has happened to me before at some point. So why do we want to reuse timber in existing buildings? Um, well, it, we, why do we want to use timber in existing buildings? How do we want to grade timber? And how do we assess timber strength? So actually, you can read the slide yourself. I've just stumbled over my English, but that's what we're going to be covering today. I'm just frantically waiting for the slides to jump ahead whilst I'm talking. So why are we use timber in existing buildings? Well, the UK target for net zero is 2050, and that's quite a onerous target to reach, and 10% of the UK carbon dioxide emissions come from the construction industry. And when we drill down into that figure, we can look at data from the Chartist Institute of Building. 40% um, of UK construction effort is based on refurbishment and maintenance of buildings. That's quite a big key part of the construction industry. Should we recycle buildings? Should we recycle materials within? Well, of course we should recycle our baked bean tins and our wine bottles, so why not recycle buildings? And there's a huge opportunity to reduce the amount of embodied carbon in these construction materials if we can reuse what we've got. And this ties into another sort of buzzword captured in the zeitgeist, and that is the circular economy. If we reuse our materials, we're exerting less pressure on natural resources, and what we can't reuse, maybe we can, we can repurpose for a different function in these buildings anyway. There are some challenges when you're working with a building that you need to refurbish. You've got to work with what you've got, the building footprint is pretty much laid out for you, and in most cases that means the load paths are defined for you, so you're quite restricted. This is why developers quite like to flatten sites, because they can start off a blank canvas. You can't really do that with a refurbishment project. Here's an example of a success. So this is Stanley Dock up in Liverpool. Um, I first saw it back in the early 2000s, and I thought I'd take a picture of it, because it looked quite nice. Um, that's what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. It's, now. it's now a hotel, way above my pay grades. I've never been in there. Um, but you can quite clearly see the sheer size of this building and what can be achieved by refurbishing it. Um, it was actually a rum warehouse. I've got no idea what's inside. I doubt very much there are timber floors because there'd be some substantial fireproofing. But these are some examples of timber buildings which I have been involved with. A little bit of history. This one on the left is the drawing offices in Harland and Wolfe. So this is where the Titanic was designed. It's now a cocktail bar, so if you want a drink, go to Belfast, have a cocktail. The other three buildings don't have any licenses, so you can't have a drink in those. I'm not going to talk to you about determining timber condition, because you all know about timber decay, rat rot and dry rot. But it's worth noting, the first outbreak of dry rot was recorded about 5,000 years ago in the Bible in the book of Leviticus. And the first treatment regime was prayer. And if that didn't work, the infected material should be taken from outside the city walls and then burnt. We can fast forward 5,000 years, and prayer is still used today in some cases. The key point I'm making with this slide is, if you're going to be looking at the condition of a building, timber condition, I think, is inextricably linked to timber strength. The two go hand in hand. There's no point looking at condition if you're not going to understand the strength of the timber in that building, particularly if it's going to be um, repurposed. We've already um, seen cases where floor loads have been increased, roof loadings have been increased, particularly if you want to put PV cells on top. So timber strength is really, really important. So how do we determine the timber strength in situ? Well, we can use the visual grading rules for timber. So um, as far as I'm aware, the first standard, well, I have physically got hold of is CP112, dated back in 1952, which gives us the grade stresses for individual timber species, serving a specific function. So it's a very sensitive document for design purposes. Quite cumbersome when compared to modern day design purposes. So there's a need for simplification. So for softwoods, we deal with 4978, which sets out the grading rules. And they consider strength-reducing characteristics, such as knots, slope of grain, 
and the rate of growth. And if you look at both of you, you can see the glue land beams, you can see the size of those knots on those members directly above you. There are two grades we use, GS and SS. If you go to B&Q to buy some timber, you'll see the timber stamp C16GS or C24SS. Historically, we could use BS5268. We knew that would give us a permissible design stress. We could design with that straight away. These days, we need the species grade combination. We can go to BS1912. God, these standards are so boring. Um, that will give us our strength class. And then we can go to Eurocode 5. There are totally different grading rules for hardwoods, but you get the gist. There are standards which tell you how to define the strength of your piece of timber. So very often we're faced with an environment like this. The slide's not very clear, apologies. Um, in order to carry out your condition survey, you've got to get hands on to, that, to those timbers. If you're getting hands on to those timbers, then you can grade the timber as well. So you do need to get quite close up to it. You can't grade from the floor space there. You're not going to see anything. So you need to examine the grain. You need to look for features such as the knots and the slope of grain and possibly the rate of growth. And the picture on the right shows what's quite common in a lot of mill buildings I've looked at. You can see quite a lot of paint. So at first glance, you can't grade the timber, but if you sort of focus your eyes in quite carefully on timber that's been whitewashed, you can start to see the features grinning through. You can see the knot clusters, and particularly if it's large cross-section timber, it will have seasoned in service, so you can certainly see the fissures developing, and that will tell you where the slope of grain is. A series of pictures here with some explanation. Sometimes, when the paint is too thick, you need to grit blast it in order to expose the timber. That's in the roof truss area. This is Smithfield Market. If you're dealing with tim intermediate timber floors, this is pretty easy. You lift up the floorboards along the external walls. You can do your condition survey. You can look for any penetrating moisture. Um, also, you lift up the floorboards at mid-span so you can assess the timber at where it's doing its maximum, where it's at its maximum point of work. So you can look at where it's deflecting the, the most. Sorry, the graveyard shift, stumbling over my English. And this rather poor picture down here, which you can't see because of the lighting, um, this is a piece of timber which is covered in paint, but you can see the knot grinning through. And if you can see the knot grinning through, you can make an assessment of the size. Underneath, you can see the fissure. That's running along the length of the piece of timber. So we're not too concerned about that. And if you go to the next slide, these fissures are running obliquely across the face of this timber. So if we see fissures running obliquely, then that's cause for concern. There's something wrong with the strength of that piece of timber, quite possibly, if we compare it to the grading standards. We can also take into consideration the impact of insect attack and decay. The grading standards don't allow for this because you're grading timber in the timber yard, ready for sale, not timber that's already in the building. But with some careful surveying, you can work out what the reduced section size is due to the outer loss of section due to insects, and if you're feeling particularly bold, you can work out what the loss of section is due to the extent of decay or an internal decay pocket. So, how do we grade timber in situ? We use the grading rules, and we can also make allowances. I've just mentioned about the fact that if you've got decay, insect attack, you can consider those as features, and you just work out what the reduced section size is, and you offer a grade on that reduced section size. What is really important, you must confirm the species you've got. Um, I've been doing this job long enough now and I've met enough conservation specialists and engineers and architects who've gone into a building, looked up and declared the timber they're looking at as pitch pine. If anyone does that, it's absolute garbage. The only way you can tell what a timber species is is by taking a sample and putting it under a microscope. So once you've confirmed the species, we've confirmed the grade, we can then work out what the strength of the timber is. Now, is that timber strong enough if it isn't, there are some other considerations we can bring into play. We can look at the material properties of the timber. We can start to look at the density, because we know denser timber is stronger timber. We can look at moisture content. A lot of the grade stresses are designed, are, are being determined by testing timber at a higher moisture content than what you'd expect in a modern, in a modern building situation. So by knowing that difference in moisture content, we can find other advantages in timber strength using timber engineering. And we can also do some load testing, which um, is a lot of fun, particularly if you've got a concrete block and a crane operator that's a bit bored. You can drop concrete blocks on, on bridge beams, or you can fill a building with water and measure how much the floor deflects, or you can chat to that gentleman on the left who gave a talk earlier today about his amazing piece of kit, which I'm going to try and use at some point. So 
So the modern grading rules, as I said, they're derived from testing timber for modern production forests. There's a clear difference between production forest timber these days and what you find in an historic building. So if we take this bottom picture, these are, two, these are bits of timber taken from Smithfield. So this is the modern piece of timber, which you can get from B&Q. This, this is a common rafter. This is the original historic timber. And as you can see, the rate of growth here is much, much slower than the rate of growth on the modern production timber. And the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice the small pocket of decay caused by water tracking down the shank of the nail holding, holding the nail going through the rafter. In an historic building, our timber would come from trees looking like this, and it would give us good quality timber looking like this. However, modern grading rules, our timber will come from a tree like this, and give us timber looking like something like this, not from a tree like this at all. So timber from modern forests is faster grown, it's a much shorter cutting cycle, it's a much lower density, and it's just not as good. We can look at some grade stresses. So I like to talk about bending the rules. We're in the UK. Now, despite Brexit and the best efforts of the current regime, we are not limited to using UK rules. A piece of timber in the UK follows the same natural laws of the universe as a piece of timber in Europe or the United States. So if we use our UK grading rules, we can look at European redwood. The most we can get out of it is C24 grade. If we know we've got European redwood from the Baltics, looking at the rate of growth, we can use some Scandinavian grading rules. There's no reason why we can't use Scandinavian rules, grading rules in this country. We can get a much higher strength class than what we can get from the British standards. Equally, if we know we've got, if we've got pitch pine from the United States, UK, we can get up to C24. If we start using American grading rules, for number one, we can get to C27, or select, we can get to C30. So we can play with the grading rules to look for advantages and strength in historic timber, which helps push the balance in favour towards refurbishing buildings and retaining that timber within that building. So here's a case study I've been involved with. This is Smithfield Market, otherwise known as London's last great ruin. It's going to be home to the Museum of London, so I've been involved in various parts of this. So there are some planned modifications to the roof, and there's going to be some increased loading on that roof, quite substantial increased loading. So we're asked to grade the timber. Well, first of all, we can't see anything. The paint was too thick, so we had to get some paint removed. So we used the 4978 as guidance. We knew the timbers weren't being moved, so we could make allowances for any defects provided they're above the neutral axis. So, for example, notches or large-sized knots, if they're above the neutral axis, we could pretty much discount those. We could also make some consideration for any insect attack or any surface decay, provided it wasn't going down too deep into the timber, we could pretty much discount that as having a profound effect on timber strength. We had limited access. There was also the issue of lead paint, so that needed some sort of careful removal. Um, and one thing we learned is that grit blasting timber um, it's a lot quicker and easier than using the chemical peel. Using the chemical peel, if you want to repaint the timber afterwards, then there's always going to be a chemical residue which is going to affect the coating. So grit blasting is a pretty good way of doing this. Um, we looked at a representative number of trusses where we stripped the paint off. We also looked at a representative number of areas of the timber purlins as well. We measured the density, we confirmed the species we were working with. The density of the timber was quite surprising. The pitch pine trusses were up to about 800 kilograms per metre cubed, and even the European redwood joists and other parts of the building we were getting about 550 kilograms per metre cubed. So those values were much, much higher than the values you get in the current standards when you're given characteristic densities of timber from modern production forests. We also included the rafters as part of our assessment, but we didn't grade those, but we included them as an assessment of how much timber we could recover. So some lessons and results, very, very quickly. First of all, it's really important to confirm if grading is needed in the first instance. Do you need to assess the strength of your timbers in your building? The answer is almost always going to be yes. And you need to convince the design team or the consultants involved they really ought to be doing this, otherwise they're going to have a difficult conversation with building control at some point down, some point down the line. 
We were able to demonstrate that a lot of the timber can be retained using sympathetic inspection, non-destructive inspection methods, um, where we found sound timber, but it was of a high moisture content. We proposed the strategy of holding the line to stop there being any deterioration by putting in some diffusible preservatives. And overall, I'm going to have to read from this slide because my memory's not that good. We retained about 90% of the principal rafters. When we looked at joists, peelings, and common rafters, we were able to recover about 57 and a half metres cubed of timber. The main structural timbers worked at C24, that's the joists and the principal rafters. Now using the government website, I calculated that retaining all this timber resulted in the saving of something like 72,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide. I've no idea what 72,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide looks like, but I do know what 2,440 laps of the M25 in a reasonable sized car would feel like. So that's how much carbon dioxide we managed to, 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 to save. Now, there are some assumptions, pitfalls and myth busting about all of this. So some of the things I've frequently heard over the years is they don't build them like they used to. Well, yeah, there's a lot of old buildings have fallen down, and bearing in mind, if you're dealing with an industrial building, if you're not storing the Napoleonic era cannonballs, then the maximum point load is going to be what a labourer can push on a handcart. So they build them like battleships, it must be pitch pine, and in some cases I've even heard conservation architects going into a building sort of saying, please don't let it be timber because they don't understand it. So what you must do, you must know what species you're working with. And you have to examine this under the microscope. Anything else is purely guesswork. And it really has to be avoided. At the very, very least, just know what species you're working with. Because what you can find, which is something I've experienced a few times, is your design team, project manager and client may think their project is going along beautifully. It's a great example of refurbishment. Everything's on time. Everything's on budget. Until someone starts questioning, well, what, what timber are we working with? And very quickly, you can find that your wonderful built-like-a-battleship building might look something like this. And at that point, this wonderful collegiate environment where everyone's getting on very nicely in the design team is going to end up something like this. Which then means, at this point in time, there are only three people on the planet which are able to smile enigmatically at this point. The first person that can smile when everything's going to hell is going to be a priest, the second person you can smile enigmatically is going to be a psychopath. And the third person who's going to give you an enigmatic smile is the chap that's going to sell you a paddle. <laughs> so here's an example of when things could have gone wrong, but they didn't. This is uh, Victoria Mills up in Burnley. And these are long-span beams. And one of the problems which is quickly um, identified is whilst everything worked in bending, there was a theoretical deflection problem. So we thought about, well, okay, how can we get around this? How can we upgrade the timber? So we looked at uh, the feasibility of perhaps looking at density, perhaps looking, looking at Norwegian grading rules, that sort of thing. Um, this is very, very early on in the project. And then one of us thought, well, hang on, let's check what the species is. And it turned out to be yellow pine, which is pine astrobus. Pine astrobus is absolutely fantastic if you're a joiner and you want to make cabinets with, but absolutely bloody useless if you want to build a floor beams using a floor beams for a mill. Um, because you can't put strength properties to it, or it's very, very difficult to put strength properties to it because it isn't recognised as a structural timber. So, minimum first step when you're doing structural assessment of historic timber, know what species you're working with. So, let me move on to some of James's slides that become quickly apparent. I don't know what I'm talking about. So, the approach to retaining structural timber first of all, there's a need for refurbishment. What's the condition of the building? That's our structural survey, our condition survey. Um, what are the loads of the structural member? That's some structural appraisal. Can it support the new loads? Yes, carry on, nothing to worry about. If it can't support the new loads, then we're not, we need to start to think a bit more carefully about what we need to be doing. Can we carry out some enhanced grading to get those structural loads? If not, then we have to start thinking about reinforcement, possibly repair if there's some decay, and possibly even replacing. I literally have no idea what this slide is about. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> but the key point here is um, when you're looking at modern standards, Eurocode 5 and the timber engineering standards are very much designed for modern buildings. They're not really designed for historic buildings. So if we are looking at historic buildings, 
Sometimes there are advantages to looking at the old standards using BS5268, using the permissible stress routes, or if we are really sort of struggling, then we can go back, we really can go back in time to CP112 and use the grade stresses for timber based on the species and its intended function. Some other slides which I don't know what I'm talking about. These are structural repairs. So um, very often you can see some bearing points of timber. You start to see where, where the notch fails, where there's a split. There are some great ways of carrying out some repairs now. Uh, James could talk to you in great detail about this. I can't. But essentially, you can use some bonded in glass reinforced rods, or you can use some screw repairs to connect that timber up to repair it. You can also do the same for bearing points as well, where there's local crushing damage you can introduce some extra reinforcement and some additional fixings to stiffen and reinforce everything. Same with shear failures. You can stitch across the shear failure to reintroduce strength into that member. I've no idea why we've got a slide about insulation here, but I'll move on past that. There are various different types of timber repairs. So timber to timber repair, that's um, it's fairly simple. Um, it's common carpentry, but the problem with a timber to timber repair is it's of low timber strength, you're not really enhancing anything. But on the plus side is, it's fully reversible, particularly if you're dealing with a heritage project. We can use, we can, and the timber repair, if you're in a building like this where it's on display, fantastic, it's not that visually intrusive. We can move on to a steel repair. The steel repair is quite strong, it's also reversible, but the problem is it doesn't look very good, it's visible. So not particularly uh, useful if you're in a building like this or an old textile mill where the beams are an architectural feature. The other type of repair we can use, which um, I've actually glued the railway bridge back together with this, is using glue. Um, glue is fantastic, it's got high strength. The downside is it's irreversible um, and it does require quite a lot of operator skill and experience. So specialist contractors only for this sort of stuff. And this is how you carry out an adhesive timber repair. Um, we've got our decayed beam end, we know how bad it is, we've carried out our condition survey. Um, we allow some nutter with a chainsaw loose on site, so take a bit of time filling in the rams, cut the rotten bit off, and then cut some slots. We can introduce some reinforcement, and we can marry on the new member with some adhesives. There's a schematic showing what's going on in these three photographs. I'm not too sure why we've still got a little bit of decayed wood in this schematic. Personally, I would remove that because there's no point trying to glue sound timber onto any form of weakened timber. It should be sound timber onto sound timber. So there's a debate to be had there about how much historic fabric do you really want to keep. Another example of adhesive timber reinforcement. So first of all, we're going to support our floor. We're then going to cut out our slots of our beam on site. We're going to position the reinforcement. There are various computer program, design programs around telling you how much reinforcement to put in what thickness it needs to be and how many bars you need to use. And then you pour in the most expensive component, which is the adhesive. So the more steel or glass reinforced fibre rods you use, the less adhesive you're going to use. And these type of repairs are really useful if you've got long beams failing in deflection. They're a great way to reinforce things. Um, also, if there's a substantial change of floor loading, these systems are pretty good to introduce. And going back to the case study with, Burnley, with Victoria Mills and Burnley, we had pine strobus yellow pine floor beams, um, they're all reinforced using this system. Quite an expensive way of reinforcing the floor beams, but it's enabled the building to be reused with those original long spans. So, some conclusions. So, the timber condition surveys to establish the extent of biological and mechanical damage. And these are interlinked with strength assessments. You need to carry out both, in my opinion. You can use grading standards to get an idea of timber strength, but you must understand what timber species you've got. And sometimes if the grading standards don't get, don't get you to where you need to be, think about using alternative grading standards. What alternative strategies can you use to, improve, to increase that strength of that historic timber you've got? And that means considering the effects of density and moisture content. One question I think which all ought to be asked is, sometimes engineers say, tell me what, tell me what timber strength I've got in my building. Well, that's fairly easy to do. What's probably a better question to ask is for the engineer to carry out some initial assessment and then asking me, um, asking the question, what is needed, what have I got? And that's probably the best way of doing it. So, final slide. So the lowest form of carbon 
building is the one that you, which you which is the one that's already been built. So retention and repair and refurbishment of existing buildings, these are probably going to become a priority as we try to reduce our carbon emissions and as we try to try to achieve net, net zero in 2050. We know that retention of timber from the case study I've shown you does exert less pressure on our natural resources, it reduces carbon footprints. I think the final point to bear in mind is that where timber is involved, um, you do need a certain level of skill in order to carry out that condition survey and to carry out that strength assessment. And also, where you've got some particularly difficult challenges of engineering, you probably need some experienced tim timber engineers to take on, that, take, on, take on that project. So, right, that's enough for me, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thanks for listening.